March 22nd, 1983. This is Joe Todd, interview with Mr. Joseph Perman Wilson. Mr. Wilson, where were you born? I was born in Davis, Oklahoma, which was then Davis Indian Territory, Murray County. Yeah. When's your birthday? October the 18th, 1901. 1901. What was your father's name? Frank H. Where is he from? Missouri. And what was your mother's name? Eva Gillum. G I W L I M. Was she from Missouri also? Mississippi. Mississippi. What kind of work did your father do? He was a farmer, rancher, laborer. When did they come to Indian Territory? I, I do not know exactly when they did arrive here. Mm -hmm. Sometime quite a while before I was born. Uh, was he a farmer in the Davis area? No. He was employed there as the operator of a cotton gin. Cotton gin. Did he own the cotton gin or did no. he, just, he just worked there? What did he do with the gin? Our general manager, as I understand. Do you know who owned the gin? Yes, uh, Mr. Slover, Tom Slover. S L O V E R. Now, did you live in Davis itself or did you live outside of town? We lived in inside town. Inside in town. What, you live in a frame house, brick yeah, house? Yes, frame house. How big was it? That I don't remember. Mm -hmm. it wasn't very large, I'm sure. Yeah. How long did you live in Davis? I moved there, left there in 1906. I just barely remember it. Where'd you move to? Blanchard. Blanchard. Blanchard, Oklahoma. That's McLean County. Did you go by train? Well, the first trip was a covered wagon. Second, I mean, go ahead. I'm sorry. Second trip by train. Do you remember the trip by covered wagon? Barely. Barely. I'm sure part of it I from memory, but I do have some recollection of it. What do you remember about the trip? The most thing I remember is that we had a black team of horses named Ned and Tom, and then my father led another horse behind the wagon together with a milk cow. And the most uh, Living things in my imagination is crossing Walnut Creek here. There were no bridges at all. And uh, my father got poles and put them on the side of the wagon bed and tied the bed down to the wheels. That seems to be the biggest story that I recall. How deep was the water in Walnut Creek? Well, it wasn't. Two, three, four, five feet. Have any trouble crossing? No. Those old timers knew how to do it. How long did it take to go from Davis to Blanchard? Uh, I don't remember. Yeah. It was quite a while. Yeah. And I, my brother and I and my mother are six or so Indians. And, and uh, we left uh, Davis to look for our allotments and uh, my father found the allotments. We had three Indian allotments in and around Blanchard. That was the reason for moving. Um, I'm one, one sixty four, but she is all. How did you find your allotment? How did you go about it? Well, by hearsay only, I'd have to tell you, but most of them that did get a lot of employed attorneys who were specializing in that type of legal work. 
and my father employed uh, a Mr. Thompson from Paul's Valley, and he was later district judge and uh, later congressman from this district. But uh, those that were most successful did have to employ an attorney who knew the procedure to follow. Um, that was in 1906? 1906. 1906. And, uh, this was on your father's allotment? No, my mother's, and uh, Ray Wilson, my brother, and me. Okay, you all three had allotments? Yes. Okay. Did your father have one? No. He could have, but, uh, under the law at that time, he had to marry under the Indian law to get, a, get in the tribe, and he was the idea that they might call him a squaw man, <laughs> so he wouldn't do it. So they tell me. Mm -hmm. Was the town of Blanchard very big when you moved there? No. We had the first wooden house that was ever in Blanchard. That was a 14 to 28. The other people were living in underground. They would have large cellars, oh, some hundred feet long. And uh, they all lived underground pretty well fixed. And that was generally the way they all lived. There wasn't any wood around there, any lumber yards. In fact, it was just completely a wild country at that time. Where'd you get the wood for the house? I don't remember. I doubt if I ever heard. Yeah. Did your father build the house? Yes. Mm -hmm. He built it himself. Yeah. Were your allotments adjoining? No. At the time we were allotted, we were allowed so many dollars worth of land. Uh, each uh, land had a value, one dollar land, two dollar land. And uh, the time we got there, a lot of it in large pieces had already been allotted. And our allotments were split in probably three or four or five pieces each. I know I got 30 acres over Grady County and 120 in one place and 40 in one place. But we were late getting up there and that's kind of the remnants of the Indian land. Now, did you have 160 acres total? 210. 210. How did they decide how much land you would get? We got so many dollars worth. Okay, that was great. And the value of the land told how many acres you were going to get. If you get the poor land, you got more acres. If you get the best land, you get okay. the less acres. How much money in land, how did they decide how much money you would have? I do not know. I've lost the one, but I don't know. Do you remember Statehood Day, 1970? No, independently I don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so when you moved to Blanchard, you started farming, your father did? Well, he was in farming and cleaning up the real estate and building fences and houses and trying to put it in, in operation. Was he working for himself basically for himself, then? For himself, yes. Yeah. And how long did he build the fences and clean up real estate? Well, that's been so far back, but at that time everybody had the fence to keep the other fellows uh, stock off of it. And the little fellows all were fenced. And I'm sure that it was one heck of a job. What kind of fences did he build? Wire fences. Back then they used three wires, three wires and and wood, wood oak wood post. He used oak then for post. Which would last about five years. Did he cut the post himself? Yes, I have cut. Hmm. You helped you have to cut them. 
don't ever, ever, ever credit it. Mm-hmm. Did you go out, did you uh, help your father farm? No, not very much. Not very much. At the largest point, how many acres did your father have under cultivation? Well, I think we had about 650. And what was your major crop? I think most of it back at that time was corn and cotton. You ever chop cotton? Yes. <laughs> Can you tell me how you did it? Well, I hate to think of it. It was a hard job. I never did do a great deal of it. Now, when you chop cotton, do you, what, you chop the weeds? Then well, no, at, uh, back then, they didn't plant it close together like they do now. They had to thin it. Mm-hmm. The type of cotton that would only support so many stalks to the ground, and you had to thin it. Now, of course, we get as many stalks as we can in a row. Mm-hmm. That eliminated the chopping. How much cotton? Oh, go ahead. You had to pick the cotton. That was before they pulled the bowls. You had to pick it. And uh, about 150 to 200 pounds a day for the ordinary man was a good day's work. How much did you pick? I tried one time to get 200. I started out early and I came in late and I got 198 pounds. <laughs> I didn't mm-hmm. make it to your hundred. Mm-hmm. When did your father get his first tractor? He never owned the tractor. Never owned the tractor. So he did all of his cultivation by plow. By plow. Mule team? Mule team or horse team. They get up with a walking, turning plow, plow. For a crab inches wide, they walk. How long? Well, they had a quarter of acres, they walk a quarter of a mile around there until they got it all cut. How much could he plow in a day? Very little. I don't know an acre. They thought it was a lot, but it was very little. Do you remember World War One? Oh yes. Did many guys from the Blanchard area go to the war? What was that? Did many men from the Blanchard area go to the war? Yes, they did. Yes. How many of them didn't come back? They didn't have too many casualties up there. I joined the army in World War One, and uh, I was sixteen, and I. Uh, Swore a lie and told my late team. Yeah. And, uh, they, I, they took me in until I got to Oklahoma City. And they began pulling me out of the line and starting me again. And I became suspicious that something happened. So after they were all gone, somebody asked me if my father's name was Frank. So that was the end of that. Mm-hmm. Except you like to scare me to death. <laughs> they pull you out then? Huh? They pull oh, you yeah, out? Yeah, yeah. So you didn't get to go in? No. Was there much work for the war effort in Blanchard? Yes, it was a different effort, though, from the First World War than the Second World War. It seemed like the First World War was based a lot on patriotism, people trying to see that they got in, which is entirely different from the rest of them. But that did that condition did exist at that time. Uh, it was rather disgrace if you weren't in the army. Rather than a disgrace if you were. And uh, when the Soldiers came back from the war. The townspeople would meet them at the train with committees and 
welcome in home and give them parties, which uh, never has happened since then. They were, they were actually heroes. You remember Armistice Day? Oh, yes. What was that day like in Blanchard? Well, when they blew the whistle, 11 o'clock, everybody was hysterical. It's hard to describe it. Except they were all happy and glad. Because it was a day entirely different from any other day after any other war that I've seen. Mm -hmm. It was a different psychology mm -hmm. of their existence at that time. It does now. When did you start the school? When? Where? Blanchard. Blanchard. In what year? 1907, I guess. What was the name of the school? Just Blanchard High School. Blanchard School. Remember your teacher's name? Oh, some of them. I remember Mrs. Uh, Dean, D.A. and Mrs. Dean. That was an outstanding teacher. And Mr. Hicks, H-I-C-K-S, was an outstanding teacher. Uh, that is, as far as pupils were concerned, they were very popular. But, uh, what was your favorite subject? Well, I liked mathematics best. What did Mrs. Dean and Mr. Hicks teach? They were the superintendents. They were superintendents? Of course, they taught classes also. It's a little different now. Mm -hmm. You go through high school? Yes, yeah, so I graduated from high school in 19 and 19. And in the summer times, I went to normal schools. I went to Ada Normal School and to Edmond Normal Teachers College, we called them then, and the University of Oklahoma. I studied law in uh, Cumberland University. Where? Cumberland. Cumberland. Lebanon, Tennessee. What year did you get your degree from OU? No. It wasn't necessary to have a degree. Okay. At that time you passed the same examination you give now, but you was taken in entirely on your examination. How much college did you have whenever you went to law school? Oh, I'd say three. Now, I studied one year under one of the Mrs. Dean as a private student, and uh, they gave me credit on her work, which would have made me have four years. Schools were a little bit different than what they were. How big was uh, Ada when you went there, the school? Well, it wasn't very large. They struck oil during that time and it, it, it large, but all those schools were just big high schools, really. Yeah. Now, when you went to school there, did you live on campus? Did you board there? No, I was married. You were married then? Yes. What was your wife's name? Uh, I'll put this in. If you don't mind, I'd rather not get the name I've been married more than once. Okay, okay, that's fine. So you lived off campus then? Yeah. Yeah, okay. How big was the law school in Lebanon? Oh, probably 200. 200? Josh Lee, Senator Josh Lee, graduated after I did, and uh, Senator, I mean, and uh, Judge, uh, Federal Judge in Oklahoma City, is graduate of that school. What, Bohannon? Bo oh, no. Doherty? Doherty. He graduated after I did. Mm -hmm. How big was OU when you went there? Well, I see, I enrolled in OU in 1920. That's a good-sized high school, as I remember it. Yeah. 
What was your major area of study at OU? Well, I went into OU studying pharmacy. I had a brother at that time who owned a store, and I started in pharmacy. Before I knew that wasn't my line. Who was the professor of pharmacy at that time? It's the old fella that they've been jumping on here lately. He was outstanding chemist of Oklahoma. Debar, Dr. Debar. They've been jumping on him. I criticized his work. How come? Politic, I think. Hmm. And when did you graduate from Lebanon? From law school? 1924. 1924. June 8th. Where'd you set up practice? For sale. For sale. I've been here all of it. Can you tell me what some of your most interesting cases were? No, I couldn't. They were all interesting to me because I liked it. I did a lot of criminal work, a lot of trial work, but uh, I've forgotten a lot of them. But uh, I spent most of my time in, in the trial practice and a great deal of it in criminal law. Uh, I never did make a check, but some fellows made one and said that I had defended over 125 people charged with murder. I figure I won all but about one or two. I mean, there should have been a just verdict. Did you? Have any cases that concern the KKK? No, I didn't. What's the difference between the trial case and the uh, criminal? Well, a different set of rules of evidence and criminal law will require some experience along that line. A little bit more of the human nature, I guess, in the ordinary in a civil case. Ever have any cases that dealt with moonshine? Yeah, I was county attorney here six years during the moonshine days. Who were the biggest moonshiners in the area? I don't know. You never did get their name much. The big ones' names didn't come out. But uh, a lot of people that are right here now that were in the moonshine business that had good businessmen and were good men then. Most of the moonshiners did not drink, and most of us that criticized them bought the whiskey and drank it. <laughs> How'd you make the contacts to buy the whiskey? Well, uh, it was kind of a social deal, you know. Well, the bragging upon, I've got the best bootlegger in the mouth of the year. <laughs> you know where they made the moonshine? Yeah, they made it on these creeks. I've got a farm out here now <clears throat> by Coal, Oklahoma. It's got a well about every 100 feet where they made whiskey. Had to have water. But all the bootleggers weren't bad people now. Some of them were a lot better than the ones that were buying it. Now, was the moonshiner and the bootlegger the same person? No. I always considered the moonshiner the man that made it, and the bootlegger the man that peddled it out. I think that'd probably be true. How'd they 
they live with or where they hide it or have they hide it? Well, I used to buy it when I had an office up on Main Street from a shoe shine. When the bell bottom breeches first came in, he put it down in his sock. And he could walk around with a couple of pints and never know how to speak. I guess that's where they got bootleg. Hmm. I often wonder where they got the, the name bootleg. I think that must have been it. Yeah. Because, uh, of course, uh, at first we all wore real tight pants. And then when they came into this wide cuff bottom line, they'd use that. They'd just take it down to the shop. I think you walk with a couple of pints and never be detected. How much did a pint cost? Oh, five dollars on that, I'd say. It's long I, forgot. Mm -hmm. I was county attorney when that changed. I prosecuted them. I numbered uh, hundreds of those cases, which was unfair. Prosecution. At that time, we had the law of jury selection. The district judge and, and court clerk and sheriff, I believe, would get the uh, list of the taxpayers and they go in and pick those themselves personally from the list. If they found a the fellow that was in a way towards bootlegging, they never put his name in the pot. And uh, it was more or less a selected jury by those three. Because if you were a certain type of man or didn't think like they did, well, they just wouldn't put you on the list. You wouldn't be on the jury list. That, they finally changed that by passing law of the, what we know as a jury wheel. That way, why well, just you reach in blindfold and, and get the number. Yeah. But the early day was, in my opinion, it was real unfair. I don't think I lost a bootlegged case in six years. Yeah. Most of the time they had me convicted for it, went outside. What so, did they change that uh, law about the jury selection? Oh, what year was that? Some time ago, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But that first was really unfair yeah. to the defendant. Having any trouble with the federal coming in? No, not much in here. We had a, a preacher that was sheriff. In fact, that's about all we looked for was, was whiskey. What was the major crime whenever you were county sheriff? Well, uh, I believe they had more shooting, more murders then. And uh, was driving while drunk public drunk. After liquor became legal, it's my opinion that there was less whiskey consumed than it was before. Because when it did become legal, I quit drinking. <laughs> you had nothing to brag about, you know, you had the best boot like in the country. <laughs> that sounds foolish, but I think, I think that's the truth. Mm -hmm. What years are you county kind of sheriff? Uh, county attorney? Uh, yeah, county attorney. I'm sorry. 1920. Let's see. 29 to 36. During the war. Yeah. During the war, during the Depression. Yeah. yeah. How did the Depression affect you and your family? Well, <clears throat> It really made me about one of the richest men in town. Every other person had, had money had in the bank, and when the government closed the banks, they were broke, and I was a county attorney and getting a salary, monthly salary. I got $175 a month. During that time, you could buy a cow for $14. So the office holders were Richest people going around at that time. It was the only money he had, so it's had in your pocket. Hmm. 
Did the county have ever have trouble paying your salary? No, we never did here. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they were counted, but we didn't hear. Were there soup lines in for sale? Yes, there were. Who managed those? Who was in charge of them? Well, usually the Red Cross. Were they at the, what, the Red Cross headquarters or were they at churches, the Red Cross headquarters or where? Well, uh, yes. I'd say generally. Yeah. What was the, I guess they served mainly soup and soup lines? Well, that's right, they called the soup lines. How long do soup lines last for how many years? Oh, but as long ago I couldn't recall it, but quite a few years, two or three years in there before, before they were completely eliminated. Yeah. When did Kerr run for president? What year? Let's see. I put forty-five last year. Between they were in the forties. I can't remember. Was it forty-four? Forty-four last year. Forty-four, I think. Yeah, that's when Roosevelt was re-elected. Yeah. What day did he run on? Uh, Democrat. Democrat. The funny thing. He's been running against Roosevelt? Uh, yeah, no. Yeah. But at that time, Roosevelt had an old man who was his vice president. And the fight was on the vice president, not on Roosevelt. Yeah. And somehow or another, my room was joining at vice presidents. And uh, I went in every visit a lot of times. Was this Truman? No, before Truman. Mm -hmm. And they just kicked his ass. They didn't know left her. And I felt sorry for him. We were in the room right together. Went in over there to the meeting at the, at the National Convention. So old Roosevelt said, Won't you all meet my good friends, Harry Truman and Lips Chop? <laughs> and we introduced him again. My good friend, Harry Truman. Uh, someone told me that he. How in the hell he did that? Someone told me that he wanted Harry Truman to run as vice president because no one was mad at him. Was that, I don't know yeah, he was. said he had no political enemies, and that's the that's the reason he got Truman because no one was mad at him. Well, there's too many people know him. Yeah. Now this old boy that they did knock off, I think should have been. He was kind of a harebrained half communist. One of these fellows that were quite big enough to be a big boy, but nearly. I liked him. I felt sorry for him. Without Jim, it's hard to get a hold of. Him. I called him Sunday night, and I forgot about these goddamn ball games. People. So I quit getting those. I said, "You listen. I bet you listen to these ball games." That's what I am. Bass is getting long. He's 90. Hell, he gets long as good as he ever did. That's good. And like me, he lost a lot of weight. But uh, hell, he works, writes. His, his brain hasn't been touched a minute. When was he in the legislature? Shit forever, I guess. He went out in the 50s. Still does. He was speaking of the house twice. Been in the city once or twice. He had some way of getting in with all the goddamn governors. And back there, it's different now. They kind of run their own house. But yeah. when I was in it before, that governor was all right in the city. Shit, he just picked him out. I just like it in this rich bastard over there. We beat the hell out of him. Up there, Kirk. Yeah. You beat him. Well, we, we threw his man off. He said he was going to resign as speaker if he didn't get that fella in peace. What was his name? The one that resigned. Uh, uh, speaker? Yeah. The hell was his name? He was a big banker. 
Quindi le guerre aiutano a rimanere. Ma ma è già detto, per farmi insegnare, è già detto, non ho un nome, non ho un nome, non ho un nome, non ho un nome, non ho un nome. Do you know Governor Phillips? Yeah, I got a big piece of his governor riding a horse. What was he like? Damn nice fellow. He came out here to picnic. Who says he did that picture? He's a damn nice fellow. You know where it was? I thought. Where is that? I carried all those pictures upstairs, but I thought, but I carried all those pictures upstairs, but I thought, but it wasn't there. <laughs> We had a rodeo down here, so Red won't ride in it. So uh, Billy and Beth stuck out in there. You know. So they've had him a horse, had him trained, and put cans on him and everything else so he wouldn't deal out of money. Well, I was president of the club, so I rode up with Red. You know. We got in there pretty good picture. But about a minute left that somebody still threw him off. <laughs> Red was a good fella. Uh, he wasn't the type of cur. He's he just, just a good man, yeah. We just sit down and talk to him. I didn't ever find any put on to him. What was the, how come, what made Kerr so, well, I want to say bad. Trying his, kept trying to destroy out his name. Phillips did. Everybody, Oh, he's honest as hell. He won. Who, Kerr? Yeah. He just played that. Hell, uh, his wife would go to the bank, but she said, hell, anyone speaking. I don't know why she'd have me sit up there. If they had something, they'd be sitting with her. So she'd have somebody talk to you. But nobody knew that. I didn't either. that. I had some good experience with He used every money, regardless, if it was good for her. I guess he was powerful in Washington when he was senator. Yeah, yes, yeah, he was powerful. He and old Tom was damn near running. I mean, Johnson. Eisenhower was up there. We was up there, but Eisenhower was up there. We went with him and him and Johnson and Fuller. Eisenhower was just kind of like big name that was on the wall. I don't think it's too strong for you. Wish you'd find that, huh? I don't know. I thought it was hanging on the wall down there, but it didn't. Did you give that to Joe the other day or something? You didn't think he was governor? He was governor during the war, wasn't he? Yeah. Funniest thing, I had this down in my office. There's a lawyer here in town. Now, the funny thing, there's a whole bunch of kids in there, picture, but I'm sure I'd know if I knew who they were. Uh, you know Charlie Elder? Yeah. Well, here I am. <laughs> there he is. Yeah, I know him. <laughs> mm-hmm. So he had the picture made. He <laughs> kept me. Old Spartan Horse, he was a good one. I kept him there in Oklahoma City, and, they, and that's where I born, they kept the horse. I sold him up there to the, uh, what is the, what is the thing I'm trying to think of? Um, it's in his horse, buffed him off, that his picture was taken. You fell on <laughs> <laughs> didn't have me much. Look how fat he is. Yeah. Better than well over there. Where is he from, Governor Phillips? Okima. Okima. Yeah. Let's get a picture. Right here. That's 
saying him is street on. He was they got a cavalry man. <laughs> I still sure had people in it. Not one out of twenty two of them. Yeah, old Charlie looked at me and said, There I am. I like Charlie. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether he's moving sick or not. He doesn't stay out here too much. Yeah, I'm right against him with the legislature. 